Oh, hello there. I'm the doctor. Well, a doctor of physics. And this is the TARDIS. Time and relative dimension in space. Come in. Yes, it is bigger on the inside. It's Time Lord technology, which allows the doctor and his companions to travel. Well, why don't we listen to the man himself? All of time and space, everything that ever happened or ever will. Where do you want to start? Now, one thing you should know about the TARDIS is it can be a bit rubbish. That or the Doctor doesn't always know how to use it properly. He frequently turns up at the wrong place or time. Again and again and again. Doctor. Yes? What is it? What do you want? Don't steal that one. Steal this one. The navigation system's knackered, but you'll have much more fun. Basically, it happens a lot. But even with all these mishaps, the TARDIS, if real, would be by far the most precise machine ever. First, let's be clear by what we actually mean by precision, because it's not the same as accuracy. Accuracy is also known as a trueness, bias, or systematic error, concerns how far away from the correct value a quantity is, how good your aim is, essentially. Precision, on the other hand, is the statistical error, the spread of possible values and outcomes that you might actually get. What we care about here is the relative precision, which compares the smallest thing you can measure on an instrument with the largest thing it can cope with. Because whilst you might measure your waist with a tape measure, you certainly wouldn't measure the length of the equator with one. Now, a metre ruler can measure down to just one millimetre, and of course it's a metre long, which is 1,000 millimetres, so its relative precision is 1 in 1,000. From here on, I'm only going to be calculating to the nearest order of magnitude, the nearest power of 10, because as you'll see, we're going to cover some pretty big numbers. Before tackling the TARDIS, I thought we should first have a look at our very best machines for measuring space and time. Let's actually start with time. Currently, the second is defined as 9,192,631,770 complete cycles of microwave radiation produced by the transition between two hyperfine levels of the ground state of cesium-133 atoms at absolute zero. Whew, what a mouthful. To measure a second, you basically need to count up to some 9 billion. So you'd think the highest precision we could ever achieve would be about a hundred trillionths of a second. But no, you're wrong. By using ytterbium atoms, German physicists were able to build our best clock to date. But why is it better than a cesium clock? Well, the atomic transition it uses isn't in the microwave part of the spectrum, but some 10,000 times higher in frequency in the visible. That higher frequency means a shorter time period for each complete cycle, giving this clock a relative uncertainty of a bit less than 1 in 10 to the 18. That's one with 18 zeros after it, or a billion billion. But it turns out we're even better at measuring space. You probably heard about our first direct detection of gravitational waves by the advanced LIGO instrument. It measures the absolutely tiny changes in distances between two points in space that are caused by gravitational waves. Ripples in space and time sent out by the most extreme events in the universe, like two black holes merging. It does this using an interferometer, a sort of ruler based on interfering two beams of laser light. Now those beams are some eight kilometers long. That's four kilometers one way, another four kilometers back. But the instrument can pick up changes along that distance, some 10,000 times smaller than a proton. And depending on the frequency of the gravitational waves, advanced LIGO can get up to sensitivities of 1 in 10 to the 23. A similarly impressive machine is SPECTRE-R, a radio space telescope. Now, by combining its observations with 15 different ground-based radio telescopes, our highest resolution astronomical image to date has been produced. The combination of all that data gives you an image equivalent to having a single telescope eight times the diameter of the Earth. 
or to put that in terms of numbers, an angular resolution of a few millionths of an arc second, where there are 3,600 arc seconds in just a single degree. So in terms of the fraction of the entire sky, that equates to, again, 1 in 10 to the 23. It seems like we're living in the age of the 10 to the 23. So now that we know how good we are, let's have a look at how good Time Lords are with the TARDIS. Remember, the TARDIS can travel anywhere in all of time and space. So what is its relative precision, bearing in mind that it often doesn't turn up when and where it's expected? Let's tackle space first. So how big is the entire universe? That's not an easy question to answer. The observable universe, the limit to how far away we can see from here on Earth, or indeed how far away any vantage point in the universe could see, is currently 10 to the 27 meters in diameter. This limit exists because the speed of light is finite and the universe had a beginning. So the earliest light in the universe, the cosmic microwave background, is only now just reaching us here on Earth from that distance in space, when also factoring in the expansion of the universe. Yeah, it's a bit mind-bending at times. So, let's say the Doctor limits his travels to the current observable universe, given his tendency to hang around in the Anthropocene, or the era of humans. The Earth has a radius just over 6,000 kilometers, so taking the ratio of that to the ratio of the observable universe and then cubing it because we've got three spatial dimensions to move around in, simply landing on the planet Earth equates to 1 in 10 to the 70 relative precision. Now, while we don't know exactly how big the universe extends beyond the observable, we can place some limits on it. The curvature of the universe seems to be consistent with zero, completely flat. This could mean that space is actually infinite. But because of the sensitivity of our measurements so far, the universe could have some curvature, so long as it's just incredibly small. Assuming that the universe is a four-dimensional hypersphere, where we live on its surface, the smallest its radius of curvature can be, given our measurements, is around 10 to the 28 meters. So in that case, the TARDIS would be at least as good as one part in 10 to the 74. But it is time where the TARDIS really comes into its own. Currently, the universe is some 13.8 billion years old, but in the grand scale of things, it's pretty much still a newborn. Eventually, all the stars, planets, and galaxies will die. All protons and neutrons will decay, and once the universe is some 10 to the 100 years old, even all of the supermassive black holes will have evaporated via Hawking radiation. And all that will be left is a dilute gas of photons and neutrinos at some non-zero temperature. From that point onwards, nothing more can happen. It is the heat death of the universe. But if we factor in random quantum fluctuations or quantum tunneling, the end of the universe could be postponed to something like 10 to the 10 to the 10 to the 56 years in the future. That is a stupendously large number. Now, given that when the TARDIS turns up at the wrong time, it's usually only a few years or decades off at most, that means we're talking about a machine that's good to one part in at least 10 to the 100, and maybe as much as 10 to the 10 to the 10 to the 56. I can be almost certain we will never see anything as precise as that within the lifetime of the human race. So don't diss the TARDIS when it gets things slightly wrong, because in the grand scope of all of time and space, it's doing better than, well, you can possibly imagine. Thanks so much for watching all of this Doctor Who video. For more mind-bending physics, subscribe to my channel, and I'd love to see your comments and likes down there. See you next time.